Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Alexandra Natapoff, professor of law at the University of California, Irvine, and author of the new book, Punishment Without Crime, How Our Massive Misdemeanor System Traps the Innocent and Makes America More Unequal. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thanks so much for having me. I'd like to start where you mentioned in the beginning of the book, and you also have it in the epilogue, that you were a federal public defender before you were a professor of law. What did that experience teach you that you didn't learn in law school, and how is the federal system different than the state system we'll be mostly talking about today? So you shouldn't get me started on all the things I didn't learn in law school. <laughs> we, we both went to law school, too, so we sympathize. Yeah. Um, but, but with respect to the inspiration for this book, I, I think it was as a public defender living in Baltimore, working with individuals in the neighborhoods and the communities and the families in Baltimore that it first – struck me how powerful the misdemeanor phenomenon is. It was pervasive in the lives of the young people uh, that I that I that I met, that I lived around, that I worked with, and of course that I represented their families. People had expectations that the misdemeanor system would intervene in their lives, that they would be swept up, that they would be sustaining these convictions that they understood would haunt them for lifetimes. As a federal public defender, I learned something about the way that we process misdemeanors and 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 as soon as I left the federal system which is relatively well resourced and much smaller I realized that I had been seeing a very elite uh highly resourced swath of the top of the pyramid that in fact most misdemeanors in this country don't receive anywhere near the kind of uh, attention and resources and lawyering um, that I, that I was fortunate to be able to see, uh, but but I just was struck by how enormously important this underground phenomenon was. What's the difference between the federal and the state level public defender's office in terms of like the kinds of cases you're seeing, the kinds of people you're dealing with? Well, the federal system, as we know, is very small. It makes up less than five percent of the American criminal system generally. That's even more true for misdemeanors. There aren't that many uh, federal misdemeanors. I describe a lot of those differences in the book, but I think the most important takeaway is the commitment to rule of law, the commitment to due process, the, the, the notion that these cases are important. Even if they're misdemeanors, they're still federal cases. <laughs> uh, all the official players, the lawyers, the judges, the, the people in the courtroom think that these cases are important and they are accorded um, – the constitutional protection and the law and the respect that they should get. And, and I want to clarify, I was very fortunate to work in, a, in an office and in a court system that accorded those uh, offenses respect. It's certainly not true throughout the federal system. We have seen mass processing of federal immigration cases that are indistinguishable from low-level misdemeanor courts where people are literally herded through court with mass pleas and mass advisements. So, so I don't want to overstate the case. What I want to say is we know – how to process misdemeanors with uh, with law and respect. I glimpsed that in the federal system uh, and th in over the course of the past few years doing research on the American misdemeanor system, it is painfully obvious how how infrequently that actually happens. I like how you put – you tell stories in, in the epilogue especially about how people felt like they had a fair – process. They said, you know, that was – if they got accused and they had – they felt like they had a fair process where the state system, it's just a whirlwind and you might end up losing public benefits and all this stuff and not even know what happened to you in two minutes that they adjudicate your case, if you're lucky. Uh, and that that's a, the, one of the lines you have is one of the great – one of the uh, great myths of our criminal system is that the minor arrests and convictions are not especially terrible for the people who experience them. Why is that a great myth? I think one of the reasons that the misdemeanor system has fallen below the ra radar is because both subjectively and objectively, we think of it as minor. We think of it as petty. Of course, compared to 30-year drug sentences, misdemeanors are indeed petty and minor. So there's an objective component to it. We define misdemeanors uh, essentially as those offenses that are less serious than felonies. And we typically, although not always, punish them uh, punish them less harshly. Um, but but more profoundly, we think of these cases as chump change. It's no big deal to impose them. And most importantly, it's no big deal to get them. And when we think of the punishments that are associated with misdemeanors, I think in part because we've become so numbed by mass incarceration that they look 
like lenient punishments, but they are not. So people are going to jail. Of course, people are losing their liberty every day. 11 million people pass through American jails every year. Uh, people charged with misdemeanors are being incarcerated pretrial because they can't make bail. It's become a relatively well-known phenomenon in the last few years. Uh, those convictions are stopping them from getting jobs, credit, housing, public welfare benefits, education. Um, their credit is being ruined. They're being saddled with fines and fees. Their immigration status can be uh, can be profoundly affected. And, and I can go on with the laundry list in this breathless way for a long time. But the point is that there's an enormous pile of punitive consequences that attend misdemeanors today that have accreted over time, particularly in the arena, in the financial arena, because those fines and fees have become such tempting funding sources. And so it is no longer accurate to say that it is no big deal to get a misdemeanor. It can dog a person for the rest of their lives in ways that will influence their earning potential, their family, their education, their housing, in ways that we just that we just haven't recognized. This this notion that it's a it's a way for localities to raise money, that the fines are a source of revenue. Does it actually work out that way in practice? Because this system that you're describing, I mean, there's there's a lot of lawyers involved, there's judges, there's police, there's court buildings. Like the, all of these things cost money, and then you're hitting someone with a hundred dollar, two hundred dollar, whatever it is, fine. Like, are they on the whole? Is like the city of Baltimore actually making money, or is it losing money on this system? Yeah, I'm not sure Baltimore is the best um, the best example. <laughs> yeah, Baltimore is yeah, <laughs> exceptional in a variety of ways. Um, but let's take Ferguson because because the Department of Justice's Ferguson report that occurred after the, the the killing of Michael Brown and the the international attention that was focused on on that locality, but but that locality as representative of something about the American criminal system that we had not really grappled with. And I think the Department of Justice report is just one of the most important American legal documents that we've seen for a long time. And and what that document told us. Uh, and, you're, and, and first of all, let's back up. You're absolutely right. It's trick math. <laughs> uh, the costs and benefits. Are, first of all, we we have barely started to grapple with the true costs of arresting and convicting and punishing someone for a misdemeanor. But even even the most basic accounting, often the math does not add up. It is more accurate to say that someone uh, is profiting off of the misdemeanor revenue stream, and if that someone has influence over the number of people who are going to be brought in, the way they're going to be processed, the way they're going to be incarcerated, then that set of incentives has become a powerful driver for expanding the misdemeanor net. And that's, you know, so that's what we saw in Ferguson. Ferguson raised millions of dollars. The city of Ferguson raised millions of dollars off of the revenue stream from low-level fines and fees from uh, low-level misdemeanors, traffic, ordinance violations. But of course, the cost to Ferguson was not fully captured in that revenue stream. The public defenders, the prosecutor's offices, the probation departments, the sheriff's department, uh, the city, all of those different institutions were vying for some some chunk of that uh, chunk of that revenue stream. And we have not yet required our criminal system, as we do for almost every other public institution, to submit itself to a true rigorous cost-benefit analysis, uh, even, even just institutionally, let alone the human costs, the people who lost their jobs, who lost their health care, whose children were put into foster care. We haven't even begun to do the math properly. When people are coming through, so we, we're herding people through these courtrooms on a, on a given day, what kinds of crimes what kinds of misdemeanors are we typically seeing? Uh, so, so I'm going to tell you what we do know, and I'm going to tell you that we can't answer your question about what is typical because our misdemeanor system is so opaque and we have not required it to produce the kind of data that would let us break down, for example, how many disorderly conduct cases does, are filed every year in this country in contrast, for example, to how many DUI cases are filed. That, that w You could imagine that we would think very differently about a misdemeanor system that was dominated by um, order maintenance offenses than we would a um, system that was dominated, for example, by domestic violence cases. By order maintenance, you mean like disorderly conduct, resisting arrest? Yes, like the, the street clearing, policing tools yeah. um, that 
uh, that are often not about any particular harm, but about uh, preventative policing, about gentrification, about uh, you, you mentioned Baltimore a moment ago, about clearing the corner as, as loitering is famously used to do there. First of all, it's worth remembering how enormous the misdemeanor system is. It's 80 percent of American dockets. 80 percent of criminal cases filed in this country are misdemeanors. And so when we think about it that way, we realize how diverse it must be. It is doing an enormous amount of work. And it is accounted for differently at different points in that system. So, for example, when I uh, began writing this book a few years ago and I realized just how little data there was about the misdemeanor system, there was no definitive data on even just a, the bare question of how many misdemeanor cases are filed every year in this country. So I set out to try to get a better answer to that question. I asked every single state administrative office of the court, which is the state entity that's supposed to keep track of the answer to your question. How many cases do we file? What kind of cases are there? How many how many cases and who are they affecting? And I asked all 50 states in the District of Columbia for their misdemeanor data and um, I could have written a book about the vast range of answers that I got. <laughs> uh, so, so I think it was Nebraska sent me a spreadsheet. Oklahoma never returned my call. You know, there really was a. a I, I saw Louisiana also, and Louisiana, is, Louisiana. So, is so bad in criminal justice yeah. issues in general that I, I, I'm afraid of what that number could be. They never, they never returned my call either, and I, and I did call a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, so to answer your question. We launder every single imaginable kind of conduct through the misdemeanor system from relatively serious offenses. I think of DWI, driving while intoxicated, and domestic violence as sort of the paradigmatic serious misdemeanors. Uh, they cause harm. We have come, in, actually in both cases, to a relatively recent consensus that these are uh, uh, dangerous and culpable forms of conduct that should – that the criminal system has a responsibility to intervene in. At the other end of the spectrum, the order maintenance offenses that we were talking about a moment ago, loitering, trespassing, jaywalking, spitting, gambling. Yeah. Playing, I saw in Baltimore uh, playing dice and cards. Playing dice and <laughs> cards. Uh, yeah. Although although uh, we could make jokes about how much of our nation's economy depends on yeah, gambling exactly. on Wall yeah. Street. But apparently if you do it for $5 with dice on the streets of Baltimore, now it's a crime. Or gambling run by the government, otherwise known as lotteries. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So so the answer is that it's a vast range. Different states keep track of those cases differently, so we don't know exactly. Uh, the FBI keeps data not specifically on misdemeanors but on offenses that are probably misdemeanors. So, for example, simple assault and, and low-level larcenies, uh, which appear to be but are not always uh, uh, a large chunk of what our misdemeanor system does. But I found jurisdictions where the majority, meaning 60 percent of all misdemeanor cases, were driving on a suspended license. So it's very localized. It's very specific. And we don't have a good picture of it. Were you able to figure out, looking at the chart um, and, and the, of the different state responses, th there seems to be – no correlation from – I mean, you have Delaware and West Virginia, Arkansas, West Virginia at the top, but then Montana is up near the top, North Dakota. I, did you find any correlation there of like what might explain this or does it just seem kind of random? Yeah. So for those listeners who are not looking at page 42, 42 at yes. the moment, there's a um, – I took – the data that I was able to find from around the country from multiple sources about how many misdemeanors are filed in every state. And then I ranked them by uh, per capita filings. And so, so we can see that some states file, um, you know, 15,000 misdemeanors per 100,000 of their population and uh, some file under 1,000. And so the, the question is, what does it mean? <laughs> um, so the bottom line is, I don't know. Because you could imagine it meaning at least one of two very different, very important things. It could mean that that particular state has chosen to use that misdemeanor net in a sweeping, punitive, revenue-generating way. And I think you see some more rural states here where you might expect some smaller municipalities to use it for revenue generation, like Montana, possibly. Yeah, so we might – so we could guess. Uh, so that might be why they have very high per capita filing rates 
Or it might be that they've decided to ratchet back felony mass incarceration and are using misdemeanors more often to fill in gaps where they think that the state should have some criminal justice response, but that a felony is inappropriate. And so for the for the list that you're looking at, I didn't hazard a guess as to why. One of my uh, hopes is that um, – so in the appendix to this book, I provide a citation and, and a link to every source that I used for every state. So if anyone is interested in figuring out why it is that Montana has the filing rate that it has, I provide – in the appendix, um, access to all the sources I found. So whoever uh, decides to figure this out will not have to reinvent the wheel. Do these numbers correlate at all or track at all with, I mean, I guess, overall kind of levels of crime in the state? So you could have measures that get a sense of like, so how many home invasions are there? How many burglaries? How many murders? Things like that. Because a state that has higher crime in general, you'd expect. But then also, do they track with number of felony charges? So do states – because that, that trade-off that you just mentioned. So do states that have higher misdemeanor filings tend to have proportionally lower felony or the other way around? Yeah, I think that that's a very important question that we're not yet prepared to answer, um, in part because this data gathering effort that I engaged in for this book, which I think is a very preliminary look at what the misdemeanor dockets in this country look like. I'm unaware of anyone before me who has actually asked all 50 state AOCs what their misdemeanor dockets look like. Um, we just haven't begun to invite the kind of empirical analysis and scrutiny that you're describing that 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 we do all the time with serious cases. We're always asking, what is the relationship, for example, between the homicide rate and other crime rates and burglary rates or p poverty rates or uh, access to health care and education? We, we're, we're profoundly interested in those correlations because we understand that the criminal system is that kind of social institution. It sits right there at the heart of how we make decisions about economics and um, and allocations of social resources. And we just haven't brought misdemeanors into that conversation. So again, my hope is by providing this this first cut at the data, the, the, um, the sources that I used, uh, empirically minded researchers will um, – uh, will take up that challenge and put more pressure on the misdemeanor system to justify itself and, and explain what it is, what role it's actually playing. So let's uh, walk through the process here of getting a misdemeanor. Um, uh, the first encounter is with police often on the streets. How, how, do, how do police factor into this question uh, for someone uh, who just – has a cop walk up to them and says something to them. It's there. To, it's they have a pretty important role determining initial initial cause. Correct. Police arguably play the most important role <laughs> in the way our misdemeanor system looks. Uh, its size, its composition, much of that is accidental. We didn't. Um, it, it's not because it's the police's job to decide who will be convicted of a misdemeanor. It's that the misdemeanor is so sloppy and fast. Uh, and inattentive that we have made accidental prosecutors out of our police. In effect, the police decision to issue uh, – to arrest someone for a misdemeanor, their decision that there's probable cause ends up being, if not the most important, one of the most important decisions that any official is going to make because the system is so, uh, so fast and so full of um, – uh, pressure after that moment that often we we don't really scrutinize that decision. So you asked how people can get a misdemeanor. The two main ways are through citation and arrest. Uh, in decriminalization in many ways can be understood as um, – as adjusting the ways that people engage that ha – have that first encounter. So the idea is that by taking incarceration off the table, by turning to citations and summons rather than arrests, uh, we can reduce our reliance on incarceration and also make misdemeanors less punitive. Uh, that It doesn't always work that way. Even when offenses have been decriminalized, often police still arrest for them. It's one of the great ironies that we've seen in the decriminalization arena that police discretion to arrest, uh, for example, 
preserves much of the racial disparity in the enforcement of decriminalized offenses, even as overall arrest and conviction rates go down. So it's it's it actually turns out to be a very complicated arena. But the bottom sort of the basic mechanism is a police officer can hand you a summons or a, or essentially a ticket like a like a traffic ticket, in which case you have to go to court to resolve it uh, or you can be arrested. And once that process begins, uh, many misdemeanor defendants uh, d- don't get lawyers. Many of them are entitled to lawyers uh, under this Sixth Amendment, but don't get them anyway. Many, uh, if the judge decides that a defendant is not facing upfront jail time, and I use the word upfront advisedly because we know so many people are later incarcerated for their inability to pay fines and fees, but if, but if the technical sentence for the misdemeanor for which you that you are facing does not include jail time. You are not entitled to a lawyer. So that means millions of people are being swept through the system and pleading guilty to what we call non-jailable misdemeanors that will stay on their record, that are findable by employers, by housing agencies, by credit agencies. And they may not even realize at the moment that they're accepting um, a, lifelong, uh, a lifelong burden because of the weakness uh, and the insufficient resources of for defense counsel, often um, those cases are not fully litigated. Misdemeanor prosecutor offices are also overwhelmed, so they're moving very quickly. They're not screening the way we typically understand the role of of uh, prosecutors to screen. And then, of course, judges are overwhelmed too. They have these enormous dockets. Many judges have told us, especially after Ferguson. Um, sometimes off the record, <laughs> that they feel enormous pressure from their administrative offices to move those cases, to raise that revenue, to keep things moving along. So to get back to your original question, once that police officer decides there's probable cause to arrest you, the hydraulic forces of the misdemeanor system, um, they're far from adjudicative and therefore becoming arrested, uh, being arrested uh, really kicks off a process that may never revisit that initial decision. We hear a lot about in the f- major crime felony world that there's conviction of the innocent, and this is a big problem. Obviously, innocence projects, people on death row who have been shown to be innocent through DNA, but it doesn't seem like that would be the case with the misdemeanor issue. I mean, how you saw someone jaywalk. They're jaywalkers, uh, or, or do we have some sort of issue that there are many people getting getting convicted of a misdemeanor or pleading to a misdemeanor who are in fact innocent? Yeah, so it turns out that the wrongful misdemeanor conviction phenomenon uh, is, is another important part of this world that we haven't grappled with. So, so the description of the system I just gave you, if, if, if we take it apart, we have police officers arresting people, and you're right. Sometimes you, you know maybe. Maybe the offense is uh, is obvious on its face or maybe as in drunk driving, we have extrinsic evidence of the offense that could be tested later. But actually, much of the time, those arrests uh, are not necessarily supported by the kind of probable cause that the Constitution requires. So, so for example, even something as simple as jaywalking um, wa- or, uh, or walking in the street – uh, in a place where a police officer might think you are not supposed to be, may or may not be a crime. Uh, loitering is another famous example. In Baltimore, as we discussed earlier, police rely heavily on loitering arrests to clear corners. The Maryland Court of Appeals has explained that the conduct that people are being arrested for much of the time actually doesn't count as loitering. Just standing on a corner, we actually have First Amendment rights of assembly that permit us to walk freely in the public spaces. That's not loitering. No matter how much a police officer would like you not to be standing there, it does not convert it into loitering. When people are arrested for those offenses, when they go to jail and can't make bail and plead guilty, those are wrongful convictions. What What is loitering then? Just out of curiosity. Well, in Baltimore, um, the the city code defines loitering as impeding the free flow of pedestrian or vehicular traffic after having been warned to desist and failing to desist. Okay. The, we're, we're, the warning is required. And the, and the real irony here is that if someone – I mean I could do it easier than say a young African-American youth. But if someone reminded a cop of the ordinance of loitering uh, – 
they're probably going to get resisting arrest or some sort of contempt of cop. Because, you know, being like, excuse me, sir, are you familiar with the ordering statute? They, they're probably just going to get more mad at you uh, and then give you resisting arrest and something, a failure to disperse, all those kind of things. You know, your point is really well taken because it reveals that we don't actually care about loitering. That, that's not why we have loitering statutes. We have loitering statutes because we're empowering police to do other things. And that is a different discourse do we th about how much power we think police should have to disrupt private activity in public, to move people along, to intervene in people's privacy because we think that that is going to reduce crime or increase public safety. That is a different question than whether we should label people criminals for loitering. But that is the public policy decision we have made. We have decided to handle all kinds of um, disorder and uh, uh, challenges in various neighborhoods and police authority through the misdemeanor system. And we do it through, again, these offenses that we sometimes call order maintenance, uh, trespassing. You mentioned disorderly conduct. Uh, we, we have seen now over the years through studies of various jurisdictions that disorderly conduct is often deployed disproportionately, uh, as you mentioned, against young African-American men. Sometimes we refer to this this um, assemblage of crimes as contempt of cop. They, they are things that happen to you when you don't submit to police authority, not necessarily because you have committed any crime that is on the books of the city or the, or the state. So when you see, uh, especially if you see resisting arrest as the only charge, you know, that's what, it's sort of, sort of manufactured by the police officers, um, which again, going back to the innocence, if it's just the word of the police against – this other person, this 16-year-old African-American poor male, I mean, you're going to lose that every time and then you might be in jail and then you're going to plead and, and then the rest is history, I guess. You know, it's so important. So so the first is that there are so many arenas in the – spaces in the, in the misdemeanor system where it is very likely that wrongful convictions are taking place. So there's this very important series uh, from ProPublica and the New York Times a couple of years ago about – Roadside drug tests. Oh, yeah, those, the are, those are basically uh, just—they're like the dogs. They're just like magical probable cause machines. Magical right? probable cause. <laughs> yeah. Which the um, the manufacturers that create those roadside tests specifically say they're not intended to support conviction. They're not. They're not reliable enough for that. They're only designed to generate probable cause at that moment for the convenience of a police officer. But what happens, as we see over and over and over in the misdemeanor system, is that people charged with a low-level drug offense, they go to jail, they can't make bail, they're facing um, serious, uh, serious time in many states, trace amounts of drug possession are felonies, so they plead. And we have started to see that hundreds, thousands of, of wrongful convictions have flowed just from the use of that one sloppy test that was never intended to be the basis for conviction. And there's all kinds of little sloppinesses, little little bits of junk in the misdemeanor system that that lead to wrongful conviction in ways that are not intended, but because the system lacks rigor, we you know we never check it. So I mean, we can we can describe these these negative consequences. We can tell the story of the person who gets nabbed on the the small thing and then can't pay the fine and then gets jailed because of that, and then it goes on and on and on, and they have a hard time finding work and so on, lose benefits. Uh, but for a lot of Americans, the the response to that is like. Well, okay. So there's obviously we could we could make the system a little bit better. We could provide more resources, but on the whole, like the underlying problem that you're describing, which is that these things that people do have long-term consequences in negative ways, is like so what? Like don't do it. You know, like you don't you don't need to. You know, don't jaywalk. Don't don't loiter. Um, if we can figure out what that means, um, don't. You know, maybe this drug test isn't. All that accurate, but just don't do drugs. Like this is the whole point of our criminal justice system is to stop people from doing these kinds of things. So just don't do them. So we all do them all the time. I'm guessing that you know everyone in this building has committed a misdemeanor in the last week, if not this morning. So for misdemeanors, unlike felonies, unlike serious offenses, when we say, you know, you sh you shouldn't rob the bank. And we will work with you know. I, as a public defender, I represented many people who had done things they knew they weren't supposed to do. It they were largely heroin addicts. You know, after they detoxed in jail, they knew that they weren't supposed to do it. 
there's really no normative debate about whether you should commit those serious offenses. And I want to suggest that misdemeanors are not like that. That that, you know, you said it as a joke, if we could even figure out what loitering is. Well, the reason that it's hard to figure out what loitering is, is because the Supreme Court has said, you know what, we, it is unconstitutional to create crimes. I'm going to put scare quotes in here, quote unquote, crimes that are so broad that anyone could commit them at any time without knowing it, that no one is on notice that their conduct is bad, wrong, immoral, dangerous, criminal just to make life easier for the state, just to make it easier to sweep us up in a criminalized net, because it is so easy to create an offense on paper that makes everyone into a criminal. And, uh, you, know, you know, we have a deep debate now in this country, it is very, very important debate about over-criminalization, about the, about the spread of our criminal codes, about how many people are swept up into these um, into these nets because because it's so easy to commit a crime. And I think it becomes painfully obvious at the lowest levels of our criminal justice system here in the misdemeanor world where we can see just how common – this is common conduct that so many people engage in. So the question is not – you know, you, you, you shouldn't cross when the, the street when the light is yellow because we all get to do that. We have created – a state apparatus that is now picking and choosing and cherry picking uh, for suspect reasons, either because of bias or because of the over policing of certain neighborhoods or because the state is trying to raise money. So they're picking off um, uh, people who, for, for whom it may be more difficult to resist those, uh, those experiences and those labels. So, so I want to take a step back and suggest that the misdemeanor system is doing all kinds of work above and beyond criminal work. We need a criminal system that goes after people who do harmful and wrongful things. To the extent that deterrence works, it's our government's obligation to step up and, and attempt to make that work. But, but that is not what's going on at the lowest levels of the misdemeanor system. And I think when we appreciate that, we can start to rethink these mechanisms. How much is the adversarialness or lack of adversarialness in, a, in the system, maybe in different jurisdictions, you think affect this sort of charging, uh, what, they're, what the prosecutors are going to charge, how they're going to go forward. For example, the drug, the, the drug field test. I mean, if there were good defense attorneys who could challenge that stuff, would you think prosecutors might change their mind even about bringing one of these cases forward or look for more evidence? Uh, and do we maybe see differences in that where you have better funded public defense bars versus versus less less funded ones. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that all the pieces of the puzzle are connected. What prosecutors do is connected to what police do. What defense attorneys do is connected to what judges do. What prosecutors do is connected to and influenced by the public defense bar. So we need to look at all these institutions as a whole. It's not enough to just go after one or fix one. Again, with the caveat that we do not have good data, we, we have almost no data, for example, on prosecutorial declination rates, that, that decision where the prosecutor receives a pile of arrests and decides whether those arrestees should become defendants. It's one of the most important decisions that prosecutors make. Uh, and as far as we can tell, with the little bit of data that we have, declination rates in misdemeanor court are very low, meaning all those arrests are converting into cases which then put people in jail if they can't afford bail. That means it triggers their right to counsel. So um, when you go from an arrestee to a defendant, now the adversarial system is triggered with higher declination rates on the part of prosecutors, better screening, we could shrink the entire net. In a in a in a way uh, in a, in a rigorous way made by a, a, a an officer of the court a prosecutor to decide what cases really really deserve to become cases. As far as we know, all those decisions are related. A stronger defense bar puts more pressure on prosecutorial offices to conserve resources to be careful. Pressure from sheriff's departments. Uh, we see this in California where they say we don't have enough room in the jail. 
especially where we we haven't even talked about private probation, but where where we often have private entities with incentives to uh, perpetuate misdemeanor cases because they are extracting revenue from the process. We've heard sheriffs push back and say, hey, our jails are overcrowded because somebody else is extracting revenue from this process. I think it's very important to be listening to police, to sheriffs, to public defender offices, to prosecutor offices who are telling us, hey, these are the um, counterproductive incentives that we labor under. Please relieve us. Well, if So if the police, if sheriffs and these law enforcement officers are complaining, why are they issuing so many arrests, citations and so on? Like if they're they're the ones who make that initial decision, can't – shouldn't the kind of fixing it start with them and that they can just exercise more discretion? So for example, there's a lawsuit now in New York on this very issue where a group of police officers are suing their own police department. That's bold. And their argument is, goes to just your point which is the promotion system of the police department is driven by, uh, according to these pol police officers, informal quotas, which is if they don't come in with enough arrests, they will be moved to a less advantageous um, precinct. They won't get promoted. They won't get their, get their raises uh, as, as they're supposed to. And their argument is you are forcing us through your personnel policies to engage in poor policing. Part of the argument is also that because they're deployed in low-income communities of color, that by definition, when you impose quotas on police officers to over-arrest, they're going to over-arrest poor people of color, depending on where you on you place them. So I, I think it's important to ask the players in these institutions, why don't you feel free to make these decisions? Judges who are supposed to be in charge, they're in charge of our courtrooms. They tell us they're under pressure from their administrative agencies to move their dockets along uh, in ways that they feel constrain their ability to do justice. So it's, so it seems often like the, like these players have an enormous amount of authority. And then when you ask them shockingly, they often feel like they're under, uh, uh under heavy pressures to engage in decisions that they wouldn't otherwise engage in. So, so it's a very rich, complicated sort of sociological and institutional arena, again, because we have little information about it. We're, we're not well poised to help those individuals in those institutions that, um, uh, that want to make change. But I think that that is also changing. And so that's part of the question of how do we fix this? It does seem like everyone can point at other people and not point at themselves and, and there are problems all over the place. Um, obviously, the effects – we've mentioned it a few times, but the racial effects of this or the disparate racial effects are, are vast and they affect democracy and they affect all this stuff. So we, we talk about some things that we could do to start to start kind of fixing this. So, so where – what are the be the best inflection points on this? Do you think? Yeah. So, so the last uh, chapter of my book is called Change, and I called it Change intentionally. I didn't call it Reform. <laughs> in the, in the criminal system, um, very little is new. <laughs> We've been in this conversation before. In the in the nineteen seventies, there were conversations about decriminalization, about community supervision, about um, uh, pushing back against overcriminalization, it seems it seems stunning that they thought that the criminal system was too big then. It was just a fraction of the size that it is now. Uh, and we had these conversations, and we engaged in many reforms, which resulted in the criminal in the enormous bloated criminal system that we have now. So, as always in any of these institutions, change is tricky. But I think there are things that we can do. First, we can understand that we have a misdemeanor system. <laughs> 80 percent of what the American criminal system does takes place at the lowest echelon of the criminal justice system with low-level conduct to, with punish the, – these are not the 30-year drug sentences. This is not solitary confinement. This is, this is not the, the great injustices and harshnesses of mass incarceration that we are now coming to a consensus about. This is different and it's important and we need to turn our attention to it. We need to stop writing off misdemeanors as petty – are not, they are not petty for the people who get them, and they're not minor for the integrity of the criminal system either. And if there is any takeaway from the research that I've been doing over the years and the, and the arguments that I've tried to make in the book, it's that we need to shrink this system. 
We permit it to do too much work that has nothing to do with public safety, that has nothing to do with harm and victims and protecting people. It's raising money. It's enforcing gentrification boundaries. It's controlling people with uh, homeless people who have mental health disabilities. We're just we've just dumped all this social work, all these social problems into the misdemeanor system. Uh, and it's time that we reduced our reliance on this particularly destructive and punitive public policy. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.